Hi folks, Ron Mata here, Activate Worcester again. Delighted to have you sharing some time with us, it's great. And we're back at the candy store again. Uh, last week, and I hope you saw the show, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we devoted the show basically, talked a little bit about the Bruins, but we talked an awful lot about baseball, about the Red Sox, the Woo Sox, and the Bravehearts. Now we're going to segue into two what we consider very, very high-profile teams in the area. We're going to begin with the status of the Celtics. And when I say we, my grandson Chris is, is joining us again. Glad we have him on retainer. He's our yeah. uh, consigliere when it comes to sports. Knows them all and much appreciated. At any rate, the Celtics are in the middle of World War III with the Brooklyn Nets. Okay. Uh, Las Vegas has said that the Nets should not only knock off the Celtics, but they should knock off everybody else. They, they're just in love with the Brooklyn Nets, probably because the epicenter for communications in this country now and as it's always been is New York. And if there were, if there were, the Knicks were, you know, back in the NBA for God's sakes, they'd be beating the drum for them. That being said, they're all over the Nets, and the Nets are a very, very, very tough team with all sorts of superstars and a wild card in this guy Ben Simmons, who they made a trade for, who hasn't played all year long, and they're trying to integrate him into this into this series. And. As you know, uh, the series is moving along. It'll probably be over within a week. But it's been just a bruising, tough, tough series. How do you see it going? And frankly, from another perspective, we can look at it globally. What do you see happening to the survivor of this series? Who do you see them playing? And do you think these two teams are going to beat each other to death? There won't be anything left when they go to the next level, much less the level after that. So, so go for it. I'll start with uh, your first question. You asked uh, what I see going forward. I expect a bloodbath. That's what I expect. Mm -hmm. I expect the series to be no less than seven games. I expect it to come down. Like I, I thought about this watching the first game. I was like, this series, it doesn't even matter what happens in the you know first three and a half quarters of every single game mm -hmm. because it's going to be close coming down the stretch every single time. Mm -hmm. Neither of these teams are going to let themselves get blown out. I don't care. Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving can go off. The Celtics won't get blown out. That's just not the type of team they are. Mm -hmm. um, they did a – I think it was a huge moral victory for them to come back and show that they can win games in the fourth quarter. Um, it's been, you know – just the demise of this team over the last yep. four years, five years, is that anytime they get uh, deep into the playoffs, they end up choking. Anytime they get deep into games, they can't finish them. Even this year, when they've been so great, their record isn't particularly good, as you pointed out to me, in uh, close games with, like, what, under five minutes left? They don't have yeah, they, a they, particularly they came great out record. With a, with a study the other day that I heard, which was just shocking. You kind of sensed it, but you didn't know it. You didn't have the data to back, back it up. What is he talking about? They looked at all the NBA teams and all the games that they played where in, in the last five minutes they were separated by five points. They were either up or down up to five points. That was, that was the, the standard that they used. Number one team in the NBA by a mile was Phoenix. And as I remember, they won 33 and lost nine of those games. Yeah. So that's 42 games. The Celtics won 13 but lost 22. They were 29th in a league of 32 teams, whatever it is, mm -hmm. which is hideous, especially for a team that had the kind of record that, that this team has had. Um, as you know, the Celtics – for a good part of the year, were a 500 team. In other words, they won as many as they lost. Then they were actually below 500. Then they went on this tear, and they I think they were 22 and four or something in the last 26 or 27 games. But even more importantly, they were just blowing people out. They weren't winning by two yeah. or three. 
So that pattern is they either kill a team or when it's real close, they figure out a way to lose. And that's been the pattern. Except for yesterday or a few days ago with game one because that is a classic situation. The Celtics controlled the game for three quarters. It was the end of the third quarter that the Nets started to go on their run. Yep. And normally what that team would do is crawl up into their shell and wait for the game to end. And they would it would yeah. it would pretty much be isolation shots. One against five. Yeah, and in years past it, it would be, you know, you have a guy like Kemba on the court who's gonna get attacked <clears throat> every single time at the end of a game by a Jimmy Butler who scored forty three last night. You know, got even in Toronto, we were getting killed by Kyle Lowry picking out Kemba every single time. I remember. Like, Kyle Lowry's backing him down at the end of game. So this team, I do feel like game one is going to help them turn a corner because they've got a great coach. They've got the right guy in there. They seem committed defensively. They're, they've clearly worked on chemistry. It seems like an honest group. They're honest with each other. They all don't try and do too much, you know. Tatum and Brown can do a lot. That's part of their role. But Marcus Smart. But they can't do it all. I mean, Marcus Smart is such a more dynamic player than he's ever been in his career this year, the second half of this season. Him not, you know, becoming a volume shooter, not taking four or five threes a game. And, <laughs> again, he, he's one of the best players on our team of getting downhill. Yeah. You know, Derek White's another great example. These two guys, when they get the ball in their hands, they want to attack. You know, if they're wide open, they'll shoot the three, but they're not three-point shooters. And, you know... I think the basketball gods over the course of seven games will end up rewarding the Celtics because they've done this the right way. They've gotten their players through the draft. They did it. Or it was pretty much an organic build similar to the Warriors, built around two studs. You draft your role players, Robert Williams, Grant Williams, mm -hmm. you know, Pritchard. You get the veteran leadership in Al Horford. This is good for basketball. The Celtics are a very good story for basketball, and I just pray to God – that they finished the job. So going forward after that, though. Yeah, that's the, that's the next So question. say you beat the hell out of each other in this series, like you said, I expect a bloodbath. I expect the series to come down to the last minute of the series. But the winner of that, it's the first round. It's not the third, going into the third round. You know, we just had a week off. We have two games, two days off between games one and two and two and three. Mm -hmm. They're going to be pretty rested. They, maybe they're tired and emotionally the series could take a toll on them. But physically, these are all of these guys on the Celtics have made deep runs in the playoffs before. They've all gotten to game seven of an Eastern Conference yep. Finals, you know, and multiple for some guys. Jalen Brown's been to three. You know, he's had to, you know, build stamina over the course of career because he knows that he's going to have to mm -hmm. be playing an extra 20, 25 games True. potentially. So I don't think they'll be physically tired. They could be mentally exhausted. The series is all over the news. I'm sure media is driving all these guys crazy. Um, but, you know, I think Ime is such a great leader because his cool as can be attitude seems to trickle down to the rest of the players. It seems like you know, no one's getting overly excited. Mm -hmm. And everyone is, their demeanors are steady. They're playing within themselves. And if they keep playing like this, I really can't see them losing. Amen. You know. We shall see if they're able to, if they're able to keep it together. I, I certainly hope that they can. Uh, and we've got to say, Marcus Smart, congratulations. Defensive Player of the Year. Without a doubt. Eight years, you know, <clears throat> eight years in the making, honestly. And... I think it was a perfect storm this year of it coming together of people being sick of Gobert winning Defensive Player of the Year. Mm -hmm. You know, Giannis won one in between Gobert's three. Um, and I think, you know, Robert Williams honestly getting hurt at the end of the year, I think he should have been the Defensive Player of the Year, if we're being completely honest, because of how, he, you know, he misses time at the end of the year. So, yeah, that makes sense. It's right when everyone's about to vote. He's not out there. He can't start in the playoffs. He did get a second-place vote still, but, you know, even if Marcus wasn't the best defensive player in the NBA this mm -hmm. season, you know, they say Coach of the Year is won the previous season. So if Monty Williams, did he win it this year, the Coach of the Suns? I don't even know. You know, question. Ime has a good chance of winning it next year. This year was probably a little too soon. Takes this was a culmination of eight years yep. in the NBA saying it's time to give him some respect. 
And I don't care what any of the analysts say about, oh, how many, you know, points Gobert saves the Jazz a game or Giannis or whoever. All the other Defensive Player of the Year candidates, Mikhail Bridges, Bam Adebayo, um, you know, they're all in support. And Draymond Green, mm -hmm. another guy who's similar to Marcus Smart with multiple Defensive Player yep. of the Year awards, yep. came out and said, there's no one more deserving than this guy. So, Marcus, I'm very happy for you. I'm right. very, very happy. It was great to see Gary Payton come to the practice. That was awesome. All true. Um, the, the, the one thing that I would like to add to that, if, if yeah. I can. Yeah, go ahead. You mentioned the Time Lord, Robert Williams. Okay. This is a guy that they picked out of Texas, a number one draft choice, but like in the 20s. And he was a he throwaway. Slipped. He definitely slipped. Uh, because people said this kid is very, very, un he's emotional, he's immature, blah, 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 blah kind of thin, but what they saw in him was a young guy that if you, if you work with him and develop him, he could become something, and well, he's become something else, to be honest with you, and for those who are old enough to remember, like this guy, he's the closest thing to Bill Russell I've ever seen. Uh, there, Bill Russell was not a gigantic center. He was big, but not gigantic. Mm -hmm. But what he was was as quick as a cat, and this is a guy that could totally screw up the flow of the other team's offense. They're looking for him no matter where he is because he's coming to get you. That's exactly what this kid does. In fact, Williams is so quick, he actually plays like out on the perimeter. He'll, he'll check out a guard. He'll, he'll stop the guy, and then when the guard passes to a cutter who's going to go in for a dunk, he's quick enough to recover and go up and stuff the dunker. And he's frightening. And to, that's why, to my way of thinking, uh, Marcus Smart is a great defender and he's tough. Williams is a guy that alters the course of the game. And the fact that he's not in there at this point, uh, let me say it another way. If he was in there from day one with the Nets, it would have been four zip. That's how great I think this kid is. So we shall see. But bottom yeah, I'm line definitely is, looking forward to him coming back. This is back. a team that came out from, I mean, people wanted the coach fired. They wanted to, you know, break up the two Jays, you know, Jalen. And that's how it's got to happen, though, a little bit, you know. Yeah. It's got to be forged in flame, you know, if you want to be a championship contender. You know, and for years. I mean, this is, you know, the Pistons with Isaiah Thomas had to overcome Larry Bird in the Celtics. They had to get over them. Yep. And then it was Michael Jordan who had to get over the Pistons and losing to them years That's in a true. row in the playoffs. That's you know, true. needs to be forged in flame. There has to be adversity. The team has to be, you know, if we want them to be a consistent title contender going forward, mm -hmm. like a Warriors of the world over the past few years, yep. or the Cavs when they had LeBron. And, and, you know, not be like the Celtics in 08 who only won one. If you want to cash in on it, you know, I think there need to be trials and tribulations, and they weathered the storm better than, you know, their response this year, I, I say this, they got to make a 30 for 30 on this team if they were to somehow win the title. If they go and win the finals, it's one of the most incredible stories I've ever seen in basketball. And Tatum and Brown both winning a title like this young, <clears throat> I mean, it's just, I don't want to get ahead of myself or anything, obviously. We have a very tough task in front of us with the Nets in the first round, but it almost, it, uh, you know, beating the Nets in the first round is almost what I'm talking about, about, you know, ha them having to earn every single inch of it if they want to seat at the table. You know, I kind of welcome it. This is your chance. The this is your chance to show that you belong. The only thing that concerns me, and I will we'll get out of the basketball mode in 30 more seconds, I just don't want this series to be dominated by the refs. And that's what scares me. Well, we got to make sure that we don't have, uh, who, who are they, Tony Brothers and Scott Foster. Those are the dudes that we do not want any near. And I'm sure they'll get game seven because it's such a high-profile game. You betcha. And that, you're right. It is something to Marcus worry about. Marcus will have three fouls on him before the first half is over. Yep. And if Robert Williams isn't playing, you can bet that, you know, Daniel Tice, they call a foul on the opening tip because he, <laughs> cause he brushed the guy's arm or something. I yep. mean... <laughs> That's like, his calling. He life. has a target on his back like I've never seen. It's insane. And you'd think he earned some respect after years and years of, you know, you know, not being looked at as just a scrub backup big anymore. 
I mean, he's a damn good player, Daniel yeah. Tice. Yeah. He's scrappy, like, Think and he just gets... Think about what they gave up for him and what they got in, in, in terms of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a payoff. They gave up a guy who was just clogging other kids from developing. Mm -hmm. Exciting player, Schroeder. But in, in terms of getting this guy to come in, the thing that amazes me how seamlessly he made the transition. Mm -hmm. It was like he never left. Despite the fact that it's a little bit of a different different composition of the team and a new coach. And to add on to that, and Derek White, the other addition they had, he stepped in like he played here Forever. five years. Yep. You know, and I mean, obviously it makes sense. He came up while Ime was an assistant coach of uh, the Spurs still. He was still yep, that's right. with that team. So I'm sure Ime was familiar with him. But man, you got to give Brad Stevens an A+. Plus on his trade deadline. I don't even think I've ever seen a more impactful trade deadline. He's been a better executive than he ever was as it's a coach. I, I think it and probably coach. probably makes sense. It's the greatest turnaround ever. There's never been a team who was under 500 halfway through the year, which we were. We were 20 and 21. That's right. And we <laughs> finishing with 53 wins, uh, right? Is that what we finished with? 53, 50, or no, 51 and 31 it was? Yeah. That's the most wins that any team that was under 500 halfway through the year has ever had. With almost the same cast of characters. Yeah, and you've got to think a lot of it, we, we have talked about this in the past, is addition by subtraction. You give up Romeo and Dennis Schroeder, and you just take back Tice. You know, you're giving up Josh Richardson and, what, a pick to get Derek White? But those mm -hmm. minutes honestly offset. Josh Richardson was playing a lot, yes, you know? Yes, he was. And he actually had a pretty good. He may had a tough job because how are you going to not play a Josh Richardson? How are you not going to give Dennis Schroeder thirty minutes when they're on the team? Yep. Yeah, you want to develop all these guys: Neesmith, Langford, Pritchard, Grant Williams. But it took the GM stepping in to be able to make it happen because the coach's hands were tied, and just seems like the perfect storm well, in February. I'll tell you this: um, good segue because we're talking about building. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left to mm -hmm. talk about what's going to be happening. And you may be seeing this episode after it's already happened. Who knows? Um, but we have your New England football patriots, okay? They have a number one, a number two, a number three. They've got a pretty good p grouping of, of draft. I think, I think they've got eight picks in yep. the draft, something like, like that. Like two fives or something or two sixes. And you can bet there'll be some... Movement. Moving up, moving down. In a nutshell, what do you see happening? I think the Patriots have a lot of needs. I think they could use help in a lot of places, so I think it's pretty tough to pinpoint. I actually think the entire draft is almost impossibly hard to pinpoint who's going to be drafted where this year. There are normally, I mean, you know, we have marquee quarterback prospects at the top, a Trevor Lawrence, mm -hmm. a Zach Wilson, a Trey Lance, you know, Guys that are, like, even if they don't go exactly where we thought it's going to be in the realm of mm -hmm. five to seven picks, we don't have that this year. I have no idea where the quarterbacks are going. Um, you know, there's been even talk of the number one overall pick being up in the air, and I don't even think that's smoke. Mm -hmm. Because the guy who I think should be the number one overall pick, Kayvon Thibodeau, a guy out of, uh, out of Oregon, you know, he's athletic and crazy, but, you know, Aiden Hutchinson finished the season with all that momentum. Yeah, and that's right. So it's just like, it's, it's tough to know because a lot of the guys are the same position. You can project a team needing this position, but then they go with the other player that's kind of available mm -hmm. at that time. So with the Patriots, I think a lot of people starting at the top cornerback would be a huge need. Um, they have made moves, so I think it is to a degree overblown. I don't think they need to spend a first-round pick on a corner. Malcolm Butler will be productive who they brought in. Um, Jonathan Jones is coming back, coming off of a season-ending injury. Mm -hmm. We still have Jalen Mills from last year, and then we bring in this kid, Terrence Mitchell, who has played a lot of zone. And don't forget the other guy that they, they actually traded for. Sean Wade, yeah. Sean Wade. Yep, so, the, I mean, they have prospects, and Jawan Williams is still on the team as well. Not like I'm going to get my like hold my breath over him. But again, a big physical cornerback, there could be a time and place for him against a DK Metcalf, against, you know, 
Nikhil Harry probably won't be on the team, so maybe if he ever has to guard his old buddy again I'll somewhere I'll be shocked else. if either of those guys make it. I don't think Joan will make the team. But the point is there's youth at the position, mm -hmm. there's veterans at the position. I'm, I'm truly not that concerned. They could use a stud, but J.C. Jackson was the guy they had replaced Gilmore, and he came undrafted. So let Belichick do his thing. Someone will step up. They always fill the voids. Cornerback, not as big of a deal, but something they should take a corner. A cornerback should be drafted at some point. They need to add you another body in there. I, I see them taking a cornerback in day two. Yeah, I think Either it's possible. Hopefully not round. second round. I mean, which, has been a, which we I mean, we must have made this joke it, like it, 15 times yeah. on this show yeah. talking about how the Patriots cannot draft defensive backs. In second, yeah, in the second <laughs> round. It's just so something they can't do. Up. But I will say that they have gone on to change it recently. And Kyle Duggar was a fantastic second round pick. Mm -hmm. You know, their drafting hasn't been that great over the past few years. But at least we could say they got one back last year. Last year, top to bottom, the, the class has been fantastic. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, contributors everywhere. We don't even know what we're going to get from Ronnie Perkins yet. Cam McGrone, a guy who should have gone way higher. So he could step up at linebacker. Um, and Bledsoe. I will say this. Safety. So cornerback is a need. Safety is definitely not a need. We have Josh Bledsoe. Um, funny I'm starting there. But uh, we just brought in the kid Jabril Peppers, Phillips, Duggar, McCourty. Um, I do think that they need to address McCourty's spot. McCourty is over 30 years old. He probably, we're just going to evaluate him on a year-to-year -year basis at this point. He, his career could go any day, and I think the Patriots are in big trouble if McCourty were to get injured. He offers much more than just being, uh, you know, a rangy guy who doesn't let people over the top. He's the quarterback of the defense. He communicates with everybody. There's a rapport there. He knows how the team's leader. supposed to run. Guy's a leader. So if McCourty were to get hurt, I don't really see a guy being able to step into that role. I don't really see the deep, rangy guy. Um, so I actually would like for them to address that even potentially in the first round. There's a guy named Dax Hill out of Michigan who is kind of a slight guy similar to McCourty, and I even think he'd start his career off at cornerback and eventually make the transition. If Kyle Hamilton would have fall to 21, would they take him? He's I, a safety. I, yeah, the kid from Notre Dame. He's 6'4", okay? This isn't your McCourty guy. Oh, I know. So if you want to have five box safeties and you want <laughs> – I mean, I'm fine with them drafting him, but you got to realize that they're only going to play one linebacker. I already think they might only play one or two. I think with, like, you're not going to be able to have Peppers off the field. You're not going to be able to have Phillips off the field. Duggar, you know, these are every down players. Yeah. So how are they all going to get on the field? I think it's going to be by having maybe just Bentley. You have the one thumper in there who's going to take on Uche. guards. Uche. Yeah, on Uche too. I'm not convinced, to be honest with you, on it. Josh Uche. It, maybe the greatest definition of potential I ever heard was is that they haven't done it yet. Yep. That's all. Anybody who's really good doesn't have potential. Yeah, done it. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, now, the, the, the other thing, okay, we know that the defense needs some, some help. My personal st story is this. I really like this kid, N'Kobe Dean. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, heady outside linebacker. He, he does seem different than he's the tremendous. breed that we've drafted, Without though. Without a doubt. He's, he's a Georgia guy. And speaking of Georgia, this is my personal binky for the draft if they would do it. Uh, also from Georgia, who had an NFL quality defensive line, NFL de defensive quality team, they have a guy named um, Jordan, Jordan Davis. Price. Jordan, Jordan Davis. Jordan Davis. 6'6, mm -hmm. 241 with a 4'7. 341. <laughs> what is it? 241, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 340. He'll just, eat you for lunch for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll get the 100 pounds back. 6'6", yeah. 341, like 30 reps and 4'7 speed. Yeah, you put him next to Barmar, it's just... Ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's how you make yourself a dominant team. And the way that the 2001 through 2004 dynasty or 2005 uh, was built was for spending first-round picks on Richard Seymour, Ty Warren, and Vince Wilfork, if you remember. Oh, very So well. there is precedence for them 
going out there and spending high on defensive line. We already paid Jude on a ton of money. We have Wise under contract. Because the other thing of it is, if you have that kind of power coming right up the middle at you, and then you got uh, Gosho, the other guy that they picked up from last year, and the other pretty good defensive linemen they have, you put that together, now it takes a little bit of the heat off the cornerbacks. Mm -hmm. So maybe, you could have great cornerbacks, but a lousy line, corners are going to get well, beat. Well, I think if you add Jordan Davis, that actually unlocks what I was saying for you to be able to just roll a Bentley out there and go completely, you know, hybrid running four safeties out there and having, you know, Peppers and, and um, Phillips as Phillips, two sure. linebackers. Phillips led you in tackles two years ago. So if you have a front four that can hold their own in mm -hmm. the run game, and, I mean, Jordan Davis will make a difference day one of the run game. If he's there. And here's the thing is I, I would love to have him. I don't think he's going to be there. But I think the reason he could slip if he does slip is because he's only going to play 50% of the snaps. He's, I mean, he's and a big boy. And that's exactly who, why he may slip to where they are. Exactly. That's what I'm hoping and, for. If he was a defensive end, no. But mm -hmm. if he's a defensive tackle – who's not going to be out there, you know, all three downs. That's exactly what could happen. And we can't let this go without saying, what do we do with the offensive line? The offensive line, I am... He could go with a number one right there. I, I know a lot of people love to say this. I'm not in the camp of Isaiah Wynn moving to guard. If anything, I'm in the camp of trading Isaiah Wynn, potentially before the season, and bringing on Marcus Cannon. He's the starting left tackle. Yeah, moving Trent Brown to the left side from the right. Bring in Marcus Cannon on a much cheaper contract than we currently have when I know his contract ends at the end of the year, but, you know, some team would take him. You know, he's not a bum. Some team would take him if we wanted to trade him, and if we were already willing to trade Mason and give up $6 million, yeah. may as well get something for win before you're going to lose him anyways. Yeah. And it's, you're probably not going to get a compensatory pick for him unless he goes out and has a stellar year this year. Yeah. I, if you want to bet on that, go ahead, but I'll take, you know, a fifth-round pick – and, um, you know, bring him on or get shed some of the salary so that we can, you know, go out there and get a uh, Marcus Cannon or, you know, on the defensive side, Trey Flowers. I like it. And, uh, guys, once again, I hate that music, but I love it. Tackle is a possibility in the first round. Or we'll guard. Yeah. Thank Zion you for Johnson. watching. I hope you enjoy that. This is fun for us to do. And we'll be back with a, quote, normal show next week, back to, you know, trials and tribulations of, of being alive nowadays. So thank you for watching, and I hope you got a kick out of today's show as well. Tolf, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. We'll see you again in August.